Hello everyone, welcome to Microeconomics. Today's topic is regarding market failure, externalities, public goods, and asymmetric information. We'll get started with today's session and thank you for joining uh, this, uh, this afternoon. Okay, great. When we're looking at market failure, it's a situation in which the market does not provide the ideal optimal amount of a good that can uh, lead to total welfare in the marketplace. Examples of market failure occur when we have a recession in the economy, an economic downturn, an economic contraction, or essentially when the market collapses and it fails to meet the well the, the well being of the public. We had the financial crisis in 2008, which led to significant downturns in the real estate market. Uh, in actual Wall Street, um, we have a downturn in a lot of financial instruments that generated significant losses. And usually any form of market failure leads to um, a bad situation for uh, working citizens or the uh, public at large. Market failures are common in the form of economic downturns in the economy. They're often referred to as contractions or recessions. And we had several of them throughout history, uh, dating back to 1991, 1999, 2001, 2008, 2009 financial crisis, and the most recent one, which was induced by the COVID-19 uh, economic shutdown. Essentially, market failure is when the economy fails to provide uh, economic welfare to the general public. And in the process uh, of market economic activity, we have economic expansions, economic contractions, market failure, goods and services that are produced that can generate uh, externalities. And the production of goods in the economy can typically contribute to the economy greatly by stimulating economic output, economic consumption, uh, productivity, and also they create what is called a production externality, uh, or just in general, externalities. And an externality is a side effect um, of any action, whether it's produ uh, a production of a good or any action, that affects the well-being of the public or third parties. The externality could be negative externalities or a positive externality. And if it's a negative externality, it's when a person's uh, or group's well-being uh, is put at, um, at, at, at in danger or uh, it's, it's impaired by the actions uh, of a specific uh, party. So negative externalities typically um, have a cost to society, to the public. They're not well uh, in terms of how they affect uh, the economics well-being of society. Positive externality are a beneficial side effect to uh, everyone at large. Often in cases we produce more products that may have negative externalities and most of the time we have a lot of goods that provide positive externalities in the market. We're going to analyze the characteristics of externalities, the model of externalities, and provide uh, further explanations on different goods and how they relate. The externalities in this case uh, or in the economy arise because often cases consumers consume something that has an external benefit. And that external benefit could be beneficial or could be negative uh, to, uh, to, to society. Um, and, and, some, and it can impose a cost to others or someone else. Um, so uh, it, it most of the time when we think of externality, the general externality can either be positive or negative. And if it does, it, 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 it imposes a burden onto society. The burden could be good or the burden could be uh, costly or negatively speaking. Uh, let's take a look at the uh, situations of externalities in the economy. When we produce goods and services um, or production plants tend to release environmental chemicals to the atmosphere that are harmful and damaging and, pro and, and pose a harmful uh, cost to the public or often cases we are disposed of goods and services that we consume and we don't dispose them properly. They end up in uh, rivers or on the side of the road or in dumping areas that are not uh, ideal. So uh, if it creates a burden or a cost to others, it could be a harmful uh, externality or a bad way to deal with these products and we have unfortunately a lot of uh, goods and services that are produced that could generate negative externalities or the improper disposal of goods can have gener uh, negative effects to society. Think about going to the beach for example. Uh, often I go to the beach and there's thousands of people at the beach and some are go to the beach, enjoy the time, have a good time uh, and clean their area. But often cases people, if you look at this picture here of a, of a swimming uh, in the river, 
often cases people just dump their trash on the beach and it ends up on the um, water ocean water on the side of the beach or etc and that's a uh, caution to others uh, to general well-being um so please uh, make sure to keep that in mind uh if you see if you see that effect so an externality uh, essentially has uh, positive benefits or costs and we're looking at the marginal social costs of an externality the marginal social costs of an externality is the sum of the marginal private costs of producing the product plus the marginal external costs that it imposes to the public in, in the production of a good there's going to be a uh, private cost because it, it, it's uh, it, it, you produce a product uh, in the private sector and it has a private cost and then once the product is reached um, the public it has an external cost for society so the total uh, marginal cost of a particular good is the marginal social cost that it imposes to society MS, MSC the marginal social cost is equivalent to the marginal private cost the cost that is incurred in the private sector and uh, often cases the private sector can take care of the externality or it has external costs that it imposes onto society like uh, the power plants on the side of the beach they create an external cost the cleaning that it needs to be done and also by them that's a private sector uh, and then also we have what is called a marginal social benefit and the marginal social benefits is the summation of the private benefits of the production of the good plus the marginal external benefits that it has onto the external parties onto society this is referred to as MSB marginal social benefits uh, the production of goods have private costs sometimes companies uh, incur the cost to clean the external effects or the uh, burden to society and then it has third party effects which is the external cost uh, onto the society at large and also in the production of goods we have a social benefit which is obtaining the product and the company of term ob obtains private benefits from selling the good and then often cases private parties or third parties or additional parties when you think of external benefits is anybody that can benefit in addition to whoever's buying the good or to the product itself uh, and when you think of external costs or anyone that could be indirectly affected uh, by a particular good or service uh, the externalities on both case, in both cases it provides marginal social benefits social benefits to society and it provides marginal social costs to society uh, so what is the optimal quantity of production that can be produced for a particular good uh, given the uh, conditions of externalities and the effects that it can have to the public the social optimal uh, and efficiency conditions for society is referred to as the social optimal amount it is an amount that takes into account and adjusts for all of the external and private costs that it has to society and it considers the benefits that it has to society so to, to produce a product or a good or service we need to have a social optimal amount of output the one that considers the private costs which means think of a company a company that pollutes the environment they have private costs to make sure that they clean clean the environment and then uh, the external cost is the external effect that this could have onto the public for society at large to produce a, any combination of goods and services we have to have both into consideration the private costs and the external costs and we also need to have the marginal social benefits uh, accounted for so produce an output or produce an amount of any good or service where the marginal social benefits to society marginal social benefits to society that include the private benefits for those that buy the product and the external benefits this is more, more again marginal social benefits include both it's greater or equal to the marginal social costs um, here in optimal there have to be at least equivalent the marginal social benefit of any good that is produced considering their private cost and external cost has to be equivalent to the marginal social cost the private cost and any external cost uh, of the production of the good uh, to me it has to be greater the marginal social benefits of any good have to be greater than the marginal social cost or at least equivalent but the actual 
uh, optimal output rule, it's an equivalency. The marginal social benefits of any good or service that is produced in the private sector and onto society has to be equivalent to the marginal social cost of, pro the, pro of the production of the good. Often cases we see that um, we have negative effects and goods and services do provide negative externalities. And the negative externalities are external effects that it has onto the public that may be negative. Consider the, the following model of a negative externality uh, situation in the supply of goods and in the production of goods. So we have the demand for a good or service. The demand for a good or service is going to reflect the marginal private benefits. If you buy a product, um, you're demanding a good or service that is going to provide you private benefit and it's going to have a social benefit to society. So the demand curve here, the demand curve red curve, indicates the demand for the product by and the private and the private benefits it provides and the social benefits it provides, whoever is demanding this product. The supply curve S1 represents the supply of the good considering the marginal private cost of production. Typically, if the firm is producing a product, they're going to consider only their private cost of production, their cost of producing that good. This will be considered the market output, the output in equilibrium for the market at an equilibrium price, considering the cost, and at an equilibrium market quantity. When we take into account that the goods and services are produced by the marginal private cost, this is the private cost to the firm that is producing this product. They supply the good and they have a cost to produce it. And in the consumer side, the consumer demand, it's uh, the consumer is demanding the product that him or her is going to receive a private benefit from buying this product at a market output and price. And society may benefit from these products. If we really want to account, think of example, plastic bottle. We have the marginal social, uh, we have the supply of the product, uh, plastic bottle uh, here, uh, and uh, the marginal private cost is the, you know, the cost that it has this onto the private sector to produce it. When you take into account the external effects, which is here, you're going to look at the marginal social costs, the costs onto society. A lot of plastic waste ends up in riverbeds or in the ocean. This is considered by the blue, dark blue curve, uh, supply curve upward sloping, straight line. The marginal social cost, the true social cost onto society. It considers the marginal private cost for the firm to produce the plastic bottle, plus the marginal external cost, the external cost that it has onto society. What are those external costs? Well, they could end up somewhere in uh, the ocean and that's a negative externality. Here we have we have a negative externality. It represents some form of market failure, uh, which is indicated by this uh, yellow triangle right in between. So in this case, the social optimal output should be Q2, which is a lot less. The market output produces a lot in terms of the true equilibrium, but for society's well-being, for the well-being of society, the marginal social cost is actually higher for society, the marginal social cost is higher because they have to be clean. Uh, the product has to be clean. So uh, in this case, the quantity that should really be produced, the social optimal quantity, should be Q2 or 0.82 in equilibrium 2, where we take into full consideration the marginal private cost of the firm plus the marginal external cost that it poses onto the public and to the external sector. Uh, so here we have the supply of it should be a lot less uh, with higher price. So um, the market output is typically greater than the social optimal output and the market is said to fail because it overproduces a good or service that could have external effects like plastic for example. Plastic. Uh, you see thousands of bottles and store it overproduces uh, without uh, considering the true external effects. Uh, moving forward, um, the positive externality case it has external effects that are positive onto society. The consumer demand for these products provide benefit outcomes. 
but usually products that provide positive external effects are underproduced. Let's take a look at this case of the positive externality situation. Because of a positive externality, the marginal social benefits for society at large, I mean, again, if we have a positive externality, the mark is, is, is a good outcome to society. The marginal social benefits for society are greater than the private benefits to the firm that is produced in this product. Therefore, the market output will be significantly less than the social optimal output. So the market fails because it underproduces it underproduces products that are beneficial to society at large because they don't have a substantial benefit to produce them on the private side, on the private sector. When you think of a positive externality, society benefits from the production of this good in greater amount uh, for society at large. So the firms, since they not, are not receiving a lot of ben benefits, they underproduce them. So we have the economic model of a positive externality. We have the price on the vertical axis, the quantity of the product produced on the horizontal axis, the supply of the good, which considers the marginal private costs. In this case, uh, it is including the marginal private costs, the cost to produce the product by the firm, and the consideration of the marginal social costs that it has onto the public, the marginal social costs. The demand for the product here for society is represented by the uh, MSV curve, uh, which is red, and the demand for the good, yellow, in this case by the consumer, it's um, represented by the yellow demand curve, which is uh, indicating the marginal private benefits for those that buy the product and that are so, um, and, and produced by the firm. So the market will only produce where the consumer demand, which is represented by the yellow curve, uh, is intersecting or in equilibrium with the supply curve at point E1. That's the market output that provides private benefits to the consumers of the good only and the producers of the good. But since those products are beneficial or they're good for society, the good itself could be could be produced. Uh, the quantity supply of the good could be E2 here, E2, and the social optimal output should be greater than the market output, which is Q1. The red curve represents the social benefits that it has onto society at large. That includes the private benefits, which comes from here, from the demand side, plus any external benefits to the rest of the public. Um, but this this output is not produced. This this uh, red curve here is not produced. Technically, the social optimal output of a positive externality does not occur. So this yellow area represents market failure because technically goods that are beneficial for society should be operating here at E2 uh, for a social benef beneficial outcome. Think about solar panels, for example. They are environmentally friendly. Uh, they're a better way of conducting energy. Uh, they're a little bit more expensive. If you notice, the price here in equilibrium is a little more expensive. And for society at large, the marginal social benefits could be more beneficial because to produce energy requires you know, dam creations, uh, some power plants and so on, uh, but the market uh, produces still limited quantity. Market output is still relatively uh, limited quantity, uh, so it underproduces them. Uh, yet, uh, so positive externality goods tend to be underproduced in the market. Now, internalizing externalities and how externalities can um, influence economic activity is important. Internalizing. Um, externalities is important because an externality that's internalized uh, has the following effects on a group of people or persons that uh, generate the externality or incorporate their own private or internal cost benefit um, uh, benefit calculations to the external effect. Uh, so again, okay, the internalization of externalities uh, is an externality that is internalized if the persons or the group of people that generate the externality incorporate their own private or uh, internal cost benefits into their calculations of the external effects. Uh, I was a little bit, you know, word puzzling there. What that means is if a company produces a product that is going to have private costs and external costs, they consider it in their production process. 
So therefore, they have take into full consideration that it has private costs and external costs. They are socially responsible. Another way to explain this is socially uh, responsible companies that take into consideration their private costs, which is the cost to produce the good or service, and any external costs that they're going to generate and they take responsibility of it, internalize that cost and truly reflect. This is a company that produces a product that is, for example, environmentally friendly. They internalize the cost to produce a product plus making it uh, environmentally friendly on both situations, both of them are taking into account the external cost to the environment. Persuasion is important when it comes to externality effects. Um, many negative externalities arise primarily because a group of people or corporations, I would say corporations, people, or groups do not consider the other individual or the public at large when they take into account an action. Um, and it takes a while to, for, you, for someone to persuade someone to take into consideration someone else's well-being. You have to convince them that it's in the best interest of the company, the individual, or the party, or the group to consider the well-being of other people rather than the private sector uh, profits. Uh, often cases it used to be just a profit-driven market economy, just profits, 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 without caring of the external effects. So you have to persuade people that now we need to be socially responsible and internalize the private be private benefits, private costs, and the private external uh, and the external social costs that arise. So in this case. Uh, and internalizing the externalities are being done by a lot of companies that are now, uh, I'm going back to the plastic example, um, are producing uh, plastic products that are somewhat biodegradable, plant-based products. Uh, so they have internalized the external potential effects by making their, their cans or their bottles more environmentally friendly. So it took a long time for those people to be persuaded to make sure that it does cons it is considered. Um, uh, often cases, there are different ways of uh, making sure that companies um, internalize their costs and the potential effects on society by providing them a, a subsidy to produce uh, products that are more eco-friendly or that have a positive externality effect to society rather than negative. You might want to give them a tax incentive by lowering taxes uh, or if, if they're not producing good products, tax them more. So a tax adjusts for negative externality. If a uh, big company is producing is overproducing products that have negative effects, increase the tax rate, um, and that will affect their supply of goods to offset the high productive production of a product that is negatively affecting society in external ways. And you might want to provide a subsidy uh, to encourage companies that are internalizing their products uh, role in society and producing goods and services that are essentially good for the public at large and providing positive externalities. You can assign property rights to companies to be the producers of a good uh, with, the, with the exclusivity that it's going to be eco-friendly. Um, you can consider uh, the effects that you can consider the effects that it has onto the air, to the ocean pollution. Um, when companies produce, uh, oil companies have had this uh, very um, well-known history of polluting the ocean uh, with oil spills. So uh, it's important to uh, keep them accountable and make sure that they are responsible and they uh, incur the costs. If anything damaging occurs to the marine life, the ocean, and consider air uh, pollution for those releasing environmental emissions. Um, so uh, we need to um, uh, keep those spaces free, free of private sector control. Um, so uh, often cases, uh, a lot of companies used to or continue to drop waste into the deep ocean, uh, affecting the uh, the life of the local marine life as, uh, and broader scale without considering that. So it's important to make sure that you have strong regulations for uh, polluting the environment. Essentially, we do need the environment to live. And we need to make companies responsible and, and move in the, uh, forward in the path of more cleaner, environmentally friendly products that can help move forward the consumption of the future. Let's take a look at the uh, tax model.
taxing an externality, a product that has significant externalities. You can tax a product, as I mentioned here, to adjust for negative externality so they don't produce it or they have to pay the tax to clean uh, the environment if the product is harmful. But if you overtax the product, you may end up with a lot less of the good and it may be needed. That's the catch-22. Some products are needed because that's the only way society can function to some extent. So you may need the product, but if you tax it a lot, it's not going to be produced. So the government can miscalculate the tax and overtax. And if it's overtax, the government output results in a lot lower. If you notice, it's reaching zero. Uh, if the government imposes a heavy corrective tax on an externality-based good. So we have the demand for the product indicated by the red curve, the supply of the good, S1, by the private sector. Um, here we have the supply of the good in the market is quantity of output Q1, which is significantly higher from zero to a greater quantity. Uh, and we have the private sector cost to produce that product. And if the uh, private sector is considering the effects onto society, we're going to have, be a, have a production of uh, supply curve S2 here. S2 is considering the social cost to the public. Um, so the external the external costs are going to be the difference between the marginal social cost and the uh, private sector cost. So the actual quantity that should be produced should be a lot less for society. Social optimal quantity of output should be less. And I would do say that it's hard to produce a less of an output for society even though it's beneficial because society demands more products as the economy moves forward so companies typically instead of cutting production for a social optimal output capability they need to increase production resulting in unfortunate waste so it's not necessarily just the part of the companies that need to play their role in uh, improving their products but also we as consumers we have to be responsible not to over consume or over dispose improperly the products that we use uh, because uh, so companies have to continue supplying if the demand is there if the shift in demand increases now uh, if you impose a heavy tax for companies to continue producing the supply of the good um, decreases even more with the tax the supply uh, with government correction tax mechanism is going to be cut down all the way down to close to zero margins and the price is going to be more expensive. So I would I would say a, a small tax with corporate responsibility to produce products that are environmentally friendly can mediate this external cost um, instead of completely uh, correcting the company to produce less output unless it's really, really, really damaging. Um, so it's, it, it, it requires a compromise on both ends, but that's often difficult to reach. Um, internalizing the externalities further. Companies often can voluntarily decide to um, produce less so they can actually recognize that that product is harmful um, through a voluntary agreement to underproduce or, or lower the production if the products are harmful. Or to limit their environmental emissions. Often we refer to this as environmental emission of green gases because those are the, uh, eventually harmful. But the plastic waste too, rubber creation, etc., is harmful for the environment long term. Not in the short term effect, but long term. It's important to recognize that. Um, but that's the difficulty. It's difficult because you're asking companies to voluntarily lower their production or increase their regulations on their own, and that affects their profits. And then we have chaos uh, theorem. And the chaos theorem is the proposition that uh, the private sector between the public and, and, and the private uh, companies will often um, reach their own individual resolutions. Uh, chaos theorem is a hopeful theorem that actually looks at the well, at the good heart of people, at the good hearts of people. Basically, it's saying that the private sector composed of people that are managing these companies can recognize that their product could be harmful and there could be negative externalities and if there's proper assignation of property rights, government recognition, uh, company structure, then they on their own can resolve the issues uh, of the product uh, creating externalities and the transaction costs can actually decline. 
they can clean the environment, they can uh, take into consideration the effects that they have onto the public and to society at large, because the public are the consumers of their good, so they need to continue going uh, and providing them quality-based products. Um, it takes a while, it really does take philanthropy and some form of visionary leaders to make sure that the companies move forward in that direction but there's always a trade-off that it takes some time for that to occur um, and also government officials to assign this um, property rights and government policy accordingly to encourage those companies to move in that direction um, during the Obama administration there were a lot of achievements done to protect the environment and it has to, it was uh, referred to as uh, various uh, public policies to um, um, regulate private sector corporations that were either drilling in the Arctic uh, Ocean or in the North uh, Pole or uh, oil drilling, and et cetera, or carbon, carbon emissions. Uh, they, it was established to set strong government regulations to limit uh, green, green gases or carbon emissions uh, essentially uh, some, of, some of the most prominent. So governments can either apply direct regulations to the companies that generate negative externalities and encourage the production of products that provide positive externality, externalities. Um, some countries are doing this to an extent or some cities are doing this to an extent. For example, the Netherlands uh, in Amsterdam, uh, the city plans to have more bike lanes than actual car lanes by 2030 because of the environmental combustion emissions. So government can play a crucial role. Um, and regulations are difficult to approve and they're difficult to remove. Because they're difficult to approve because companies don't like to be regulated and they're difficult to remove because they have to go through the political process on either end. But once they're achieved, they have to be set in place. But we know, we saw that the US did pull out of the Paris Accord to protect the environment. Um, again, it has to do with the companies still need to produce to satisfy society's demands and output productivity, but we do need to improve our environment, our livelihood and well-being. That needs to be taken into consideration and of importance. Um, you just take a look when you, next time you go to the beach, you know, enjoy the waves, enjoy the ocean, enjoy the time there, but often take a look at how people are not also being responsible on their own by cleaning their area, disposing the trash. Little things like that can make the public well-being better by also the consumers and society playing an important role. Uh, okay, environmental policy. Uh, method one, either the government takes full regulation, command, and control of situations that are harmful to the environment, um, and this is often by specifying certain types of pollution regulations, control, technology implementation that can be produced, uh, used by the producers or provide them subsidies, anything that the government can do to encourage production. Setting quantity restrictive goals applied to some factories that are emitting pollutions. This is typically done by cap and trade, capping the amount of environmental emissions that a, a company that can that is polluting can emit during a year. Uh, China and uh, to some extent European countries and the U.S. Uh, agreed to cut emissions by 2030, a few years back, but then the U.S. repealed those agreements. Uh, again, um, it, 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 it's, it's, it's a little troublesome, but the U.S. move out of those um, regulations because it argued that it will affect business activity, but the your health is, is important. Um, Method two is by setting some form of emission tax. Uh, an emission tax is you allow the company to continue producing, but you tax them. The ideal corrective tax is equal to the marginal external uh, costs. Basically, you tax them according to the external costs that they have onto society, associated with the product that they produce and the externality that they produce it, uh, that they, they, the externality that it produces. Essentially, you tax them according to their exter external effects to clean whatever they are releasing, or you make the company clean. Uh, uh, and also tax them. Uh, then we have method three, which is you, you give a polluting permit. Um, companies can provide uh, a bid to pollute, but not a bid to pollute, they can provide a bid to buy the rights to produce a product that may emit pollutions, um, polluting per permits. 
uh, on their cap and trade system, there's a cap or a ceiling that is placed on how much a company can be allowed to emit. And once the company reaches those uh, limits, it cannot produce that product anymore. But if another company has not reached those limits, they can sell the permit to a different company to use that that um, that extra um, polluting emissions, uh, which is interesting because companies that are not that are under the cap, they can auction their permits to different companies that have already re already reached their cap, and as long as and, and it's allowed to, as long as companies are able to buy the permit, then whoever gets it uh, buys the permit. Uh, so going on to the goods and services, we talk about how goods and services could be beneficial, could have a cost, could have externalities, could have good outcomes, bad outcomes, regulated outcomes. Essentially, the public, if you look at this picture, we got to settle down. You know, We consume a lot more goods and services than we probably need. And there are places in the world that may not have half as much of what some consumers buy in world developed countries. So goods and services um, are demanded by the public. Here, the public buys more TVs and appliances than they read a book, right? So going forward, that's my two cents. Goods and services are typically uh, rivalrous in consumption and non-rivalrous in consumption. When a, com when a good is a, a rivalrous, it's a good whose consumption by a person reduces the consumption by others. You basically, another person cannot buy the products if they're already exhausted. And non-rivalrous in consumption is a good whose consumption by a person does not reduce the consumption of uh, by others. Basically other people can still access the good uh, and they fall in different categories. Rivalry goods versus non-rivalry goods. If I buy a laptop the other person may not have it if it's already gone. Non-rivalry is that if I go to a, a, a particular service uh, concert there's thousands of people that can still consume that concert in a different locations but they cannot have exactly this one private product. So we have rivalry and consumption and non rivalry in consumption, where many people can still buy the product if it's non rivalrous And if it's rivalry in consumption, other people may cannot buy cannot buy the same good. That falls under the category in uh, private goods are typically rival uh, rib, uh, rivalrous in consumption, meaning that if you buy it, someone else may not be able to buy that exact except uh, that exact same good. So private goods are produced in the market by the private sector, by the firms, and are offered for sale. They're, they tend to be rivalry in consumption, because if you buy yours, it's yours. You pay for it, and the other person can't have your product unless they buy it. Uh, so think about, for example, a smartphone. There's a lot of them, but only those that buy it are the ones that have it. So they're offered for sale, they're rivalry in consumption. Uh, one use of the good makes it unavailable for the other, and the other person has to pay for it uh, in order to obtain it. And you know, phones are very expensive now. Uh, and they are highly excludable. Consumers, uh, it has excludability factors. Non um, uh, rivalry goods tend to be private goods that are offered for sale. And the rivalry characteristic is that one good, when it's purchased, the other person cannot have it. They're highly exclusive. They're excludable in consumption. Consumers unable or unwilling to buy the good or to pay for the good cannot benefit from the product. Um, unless they pay for it. So private goods. And then we have public goods, which is a public service, public good that is available for the majority of the public. So if someone, if a person consumes a product, it doesn't reduce the ability from someone else to experience the product. Think about the 4th of July's fireworks, for example, uh, during the fire show in uh, cities. They're offered by typically public companies, uh, public agencies, the government sector, uh, different companies that offer public services, public goods, or they're offered by the government, for example. And one of them is the, uh, I like to give the example of, or, of the 4th of July, because if you go, you can enjoy it for free, and someone else can still enjoy it, uh, unless they don't want to go. And then think about public services, such as electricity at night. Uh, it's offered by the city or the state, etc., where we are. It's a public good. You walking on one side of the sidewalk doesn't affect someone else from walking on the other side of the sidewalk. Public goods are non rivalry in consumption and are non excludable, meaning you cannot exclude the public from getting access to that product. Excludable goods 
it's a good whereby it's possible to exclude someone else from receiving the benefits of the good. This is a private goods characteristics. I'm excluding you from using the same product that I have because I bought it. It's private. Uh, it's high, highly exclusive, highly excludable. Uh, typically, private goods that are paid for are rivalry, excludable, and um, someone else cannot uh, use it at the same time. Non-excludable are typically public goods that are non rivalrous where a good uh, can be used by multiple people or many people. A good whereby it's impossible to exclude someone from obtaining it. It's like everybody's entitled to, for example, the common saying to uh, uh, an education. Although education, it's, it's a quasi-public good. It's semi-private, semi-public. Um, if you, you can go to a private education, you can exclude someone if you're not paying the fee. Uh, and then public education, it's not excludable. If you go to the public system, uh, most people are basically given the opportunity to uh, receive the benefits of a public education system. Uh, public goods. They're often the issue of public goods that is often referred to as a free rider uh, situation. If they're offered to, by the government to society and most people can benefit, we have a free rider issue. The public can benefit um, at the expense of others. Um, in often cases, the market won't supply these products because um, they cannot charge people from the usage of it. The market will not produce non-excludable public goods uh, or if they just don't produce them because it benefits everyone and even if you buy it, someone else can still benefit from it. Uh, we have a free rider problem. So there are often why, there's often a reason why some goods are free or some goods are public because you have people that would just benefit from them without paying. Um, there, that's and you might can, and you can come, uh, you can think of the common view when it comes to certain services that the general public has uh, access to, that other people think that they they are free riding the system. Uh, other people can benefit from from uh, the usage of non-excludable public goods that are offered for free or uh, at a low service cost to the majority of the, of the public. And the private sector of businesses won't provide them, won't sell them um, in, in the market. Uh, we're going to complete our discussion with asymmetric information. Often cases, asymmetric information is present in the market. And it's information that either the buyer of a good or the seller of a good has in the market and the other one doesn't. This is more or less having incomplete information. Asymmetric information is when either the buyer or the seller knows something that the other person doesn't. It's like when I'm selling a car and I know it's not good, I want to sell it. I know it's only going to be good for like 30 days and I give you a warranty for 20 days. And then after 30 days, you're on your own. And if you're the buyer, you may not know that it's not functioning well, but I'm going to sell it anyways. So I, that's a hypothetical example that it's just when someone has incomplete information when the buyer or the seller in the market has some knows something or has information that the other person doesn't this is often referred to for example uh, it can be kind of think of inside trading when the inside trader knows something that the uh, regular investors do not um, and they sell a product and, and so on so this is having incomplete information and it can lead to bad outcomes. It affects the demand for a good. It also affects the supply of the good. Uh, it's faulty information or incomplete information or uh, information that can benefit one, which is the buyer, or it can benefit the seller, depending on how the information is used. Then we have symmetric information. Symmetric information is when everybody knows the full ins and outs of the market and of the good. If you sell a product with asymmetric information, you can increase the demand or you can increase the supply. With when, when the product becomes symmetric, then both the buyer and the seller know the information. At that point, it may actually lower the willingness to buy. So let's take a look at the asymmetric information model. This model illustrates the price of the good and the cost in the vertical axis the quantity of the good on the horizontal axis, the supply of the good reflected by the marginal private cost of producing the good, 
and then we have the demand for the product by the consumers, demand one, with asymmetric information. The demand for the good provides private benefits to the consumer and to the seller. And the, in this case, we have asymmetric information, where initially the seller that is selling the good has some information that the buyer does not. The buyer does not know exactly what's wrong with this product or what's the deal with this product. The seller does, asymmetric information. So when you have asymmetric information, the demand is E1, and the output with asymmetric information, you sell a lot more. So when you're selling a product knowing that it's not good, the demand for a product is there. If the consumers find out the full symmetric information, when the consumer becomes aware or it acquires information of the product that it didn't know before, then the demand for the product is going to decline. It declines. This is negative information. If your demand drops, well, the symmetric information was bad and the demand decreased. So the demand becomes red here. It lowers because you have become symmetrically informed. In a bad situation, demand drops and the demand and output with symmetric information is a lot lower. So it's getting closer to zero. So symmetric information can be negative. It lowers your demand for the product. And asymmetric information is when either the seller knows something that the buyer does not and they sell the good anyways. If, it is, if you have good information, if the buyer knows that this is a good product and later on it's going to improve, then it can increase the demand. It can potentially work in both ways. Uh, asymmetric information, essentially, it's ha having incomplete information. And once you have the full information, can demand less or more of a good or service. Now, thank you everyone for joining the session. It was great to have the discussion with everyone. If you have any questions, please let me know. But thank you everybody.